Welcome to the Lakota Wisdom Series. This is episode three of five, The Sacred Art of Lakota Bowmaking with Joseph Marshall III. Joseph is, Joseph was born and raised on the Rosebud Sioux Reservation and holds a PhD from the Reservation University, which he helped to establish. He is a storyteller, a historian, and an award-winning author of 18 books, including Crazy Horse Weeps, The Lakota Way, and The Journey of Crazy Horse. His first language is Lakota. He handcrafts primitive Lakota bows and arrows, which is what we're gonna be discussing today. I'm really excited to see his work and, and the process that goes into it. I know it's a very spiritual, very connected process. He's also a specialist in wilderness survival. So that is the topic of why we're here. And we also have a couple of guests with us in our audience, in our virtual audience. We have Mike Harris and Christina Simak. Christina will lead us in meditation to ground our little mini circle here. And those of you that watch this later on YouTube can follow along and be grounded in the space with us, no matter what time you're watching this or what day or what year. So I'm going to briefly have Mike and Christina in that order, introduce yourselves. And then um, Christina, when you're introducing yourself after Mike, just begin the meditation for three to five minutes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Christina. Uh, my name is Mike Harris. I'm located in Southern New Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia. Oh and my, um, <clears throat> my reason for being here, my, my connection to this is that um, I was introduced about five years ago to a Lakota ceremony and I was, um, I was immediately drawn in uh, the, the sense of, uh, the sense of connection to both spirituality and the earth. Um, was unlike anything I've experienced before in my life. And I had the opportunity to participate in a, uh, in a number of ceremonies. And as I did that, I found my life changing. And yet I couldn't tell you that I feel like other than what I know in my bones, that I know anything about, I really know anything about Lakota traditions. And my reason for being here is that I want to take a step forward in that journey. So uh, Christina, thank you for having me here. And, uh, and Joseph, thank you for being with us today. Sure, glad you're here. Thank you, Mike. I've invited the people that I have because I have the utmost respect for them. And I know that they are uh, people that I want in this space with Joseph and I. So again, thank you for being here, Mike. I appreciate it. Christina, well, you don't have video by the way, just so you know. Oh. I love seeing your beautiful face. There we go. Hello, lovely. Hi. All right, you? Christina, what brings you here and um, to a second call with us? Most people, um, I have them visit once, but I really love your meditations that ground us in the space and your energy that's here. So thank you for being with us again. And I'd like you to introduce who you are, what you do, and um, what drew you to this, and then the meditation. Okay. Thank you, Christina. Uh, my name is Christina Maestas Simic, and I am a native New Mexican, and I met Christina here at an Awakened Woman Circle Gathering. And uh, here in New Mexico, as I mentioned, I'm native to this area. I, it's, it's impossible to live separate from the earth. And uh, I live in a ceremonial way. Everything about life to me is sacred. And uh, so this, of course, called me and I was on, um, online last week and uh, was absolutely enchanted and was very excited about being able to return. 
So let's go ahead and um, just simply feel your feet on the earth. And recognize the changing season that we so distinctively feel all the way down to our bones. Recognize that it's impossible to live without being connected to Mother Earth. We are part of the elements, the sacred elements. We are part of Earth. We are part of the water that flows. We are part of fire and sun. And we are part of that sacred air that we breathe. Connect to that beautiful air that we breathe. When we were first born and birthed into the earth, we took in that sacred breath and we said yes to life. Yes to living in spirit and embodied spirit here. Yes to the connectedness to earth. Yes to the warmth of the sun and the water that flows and sustains all living things. Breathe that in. Earth is sacred. Earth is life. And she shares, a, shares that with us through everything, in particular during this season. We recognize the fertile ground and the seeds that are so abundant around us here in New Mexico right now. The promise and the hope of life. Breathe that in. Give yourself a moment to sink down deeply into the earth and recognize that connectedness, that oneness that is never separate from yourself. Breathe that in. And recognize in this connectedness the deep, deep gratitude for the generosity of Mother Earth and her caring and her unconditional love, no matter what. Breathe that in. Mother Earth, we give deep gratitude for your unconditional love and support. Thank you. Thank you for blessing us with abundance and gifts. And thank you for your patience with us in failing to recognize those gifts so many times. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your caring and thank you for your abundant sharing with us, your children. Feel your feet on the earth, connect to that sacred breath. Recognize yourself in this space Perhaps bring a little bit of movement into your toes and your fingers. And gently, gently start winking your eyes open and perhaps notice more brilliance, more color, a little bit more connectedness when we recognize 
we are always at one with the mother. Thank you, Christina. That's a beautiful way to enter into a conversation about something that is so connected to the earth that comes from the earth and becomes something new is created into something else that's possible. So without further ado, Joseph, the floor is yours for the art of, the sacred art of Lakota bow making. Okay, thank you. Now, um, in order to get the slideshow started, you, you let's see, I'll see You share this. content? Yeah. It should be coming up. There we go. Can you see it? Okay, yes. cool. All right, great. So far, so good. Hopefully, I can advance the slides. Oh, there we go. That even starts to work. That's cool. Doesn't always happen with me. Me and technology do not get along. Um, thank you for being here. And uh, when Christina suggested this topic, uh, uh, I was excited because it is one, one topic I do know something about. Bows and arrows have been part of my life since I saw my grandfather's bow uh, when I was about five. I never got to touch the bow. I never got to do anything with it. Uh, he always kept it in, in a box under his bed and he would go out and shoot it now and then, but I, I was never allowed to touch it. Later on, he made me one of my own. And so, you know, when I was six and seven, I had a, a bow of my own and he taught me how to shoot it. And later on, um, when I got old enough and strong enough and, and uh, uh, able to, to do the, the, the physical tasks uh, required to make a bow, he began to teach me how to make bows and arrows. So as I said, bows and arrows have been part of my life since I was five years old. And uh, it's, it's the, the association with the, my association with stone has, has never really gone away. It's, it's been put on hold for a while because of other, other obligations and other uh, interferences from life. But uh, bows and arrows and I go back a long, long way. Um, this is a, a slide to show you where the territory of the, of the three uh, groups of, of my, my particular nation were Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota. I'm a Lakota. And I was born and raised in South Central, what is now South Central South, Central South Dakota on the Rosebud Reservation. But you, you can see where that is on, on, the, on the map. The entire territory comprised uh, areas within one, two, three, four, five states. One, two, three, four, five, six states. Minnesota, North Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Iowa. Uh, if you can identify where the Missouri River is, which is, goes right through the middle of South Dakota, west of there to, the, to the, the borders of what you can see as South Dakota into Montana and Wyoming was Lakota territory. Those were, that, that was the area that was controlled by uh, my particular group of people, the Lakota. Notice I said controlled, I didn't say owned. Uh, we lived there, we hunted there, we moved our camps within that territory and, and, our, and our resources were the buffalo, uh, the bison, the elk, the deer, anything else that we could uh, help to, to make our lives comfortable. In order to do those things, um, males had to learn two 
very important societal roles. As they grew up, they were taught by their grandfathers and uncles and other mentors. And they grew up to be both protectors or providers and protectors. Or another way to look at it is to be the hunter and the warrior. And as such, as the hunter and warrior, there was one, one thing, and I hate to use the word thing because it's so amalgamous, one artifact that was probably uh, most critical and most important to him, and that was the bow and the arrow. Now bows and arrows have been part of every primitive culture around this planet going back to thousands and thousands of years. It didn't start at one place and fan out or over. People figured out how on their own to, to make bows and arrows. And how that happened with us particularly, I don't know, but it did. So as the hunter and as the, the warrior, as a provider and a protector, the, the bow was an important tool, as was the arrow. Uh, today, we're gonna to talk just about the bow because the arrow is, is a whole lesson in itself. But uh, so we'll just stick to, stick to the boat today. So that gives you the map on, the, on your screen gives you some idea of where I come from geographically, culturally, and where most of our people still live. Well, I should say about 40% of us still live uh, on reservations. Uh, that whole territory up until the mid 1850s that we controlled was bigger than most European countries. This is a photograph of, it's entitled the Plains Bow. So it, uh, I'm not sure uh, of what tribe it is. It could be Lakota, it could be Northern Cheyenne, it could be Arapaho, uh, but it's one of, those, one of those tribes. I found it in an archive. But it's, it's similar to what you, if you can see the, above my head, if you can see me on the screen, you can see above my head something similar. That's made out of white uh, tan deer hide. Uh, and in the longer part of the case where it's, it's beaded in light blue and red at each end, the long case is the bow case. Obviously that's where the bow is kept. And beneath it, uh, the shorter case is the quiver where the arrows are kept. And all of this is, is bound together or tied together by the carry strap that you see so that a warrior or a hunter would carry this. Uh, and the way you see it now with the bow pointing to your left is how he would carry it on his back. The strap would be across the points of his shoulders. So this apparatus would be hanging at the small of his back. And when the time came for him to use the bow, then he would pull it around to his front. So the bow and the arrows would be, if he was a right-handed archer, which most of them were, would be at, at his right hand at, at his waist. So that's how it worked. So this is an example of, of the kind of the skill and the art that went into all the accoutrements that were associated with bows and arrows, not just the bow, not just the arrows, but the, the yeah, a bow case and a quiver. And, and we'll talk more about that later. But this is give you, give you some idea of visually what, what it is that we're gonna talk about. After I saw my grandfather's bow, and after he showed me uh, how it worked, and, and he strung it, he, he put the string on uh, and strung it and then shot a few arrows to show me how it looked. Uh, that was the moment I became so utterly fascinated with it that I still make them to this day. Sometime after that, <coughs> excuse me, I think it was one evening, it was after dark and we were in our log house. Uh, I think it was after a meal and I, I was curious because, you know, I know my grandfather made the bow, but I, you know, other than that, I was curious as to how he knew to make the bow, how, why, where did it come from? So I asked the question just generally of my grandparents, where did the bow come from? And it was my grandmother who answered. 
She said, the bow uh, comes from the moon. The moon gave us the bow. And all of you have seen the Lakota bow at one time or another, whether you realize it or not. If you've seen the thinnest sliver of a new moon as, as it is represented in this photograph, then you've seen the Lakota bow because that's the design of a Lakota bow. And the significance and the reason my grandmother was the one who answered rather than my grandfather was because in our culture, the moon is female. And since the, the bow is a gift of the moon, that means that the bow is female. Now, to take that one step further, the, the arrow uh, is a gift of the sun. If you've ever seen the sun's rays through a bank of clouds, or if you've ever seen the sun's rays through a forest, you, you, you know that those are the sun's arrows, those sun's rays. And every Lakota arrow has to be that straight. So my grandfather would tell me that the arrows are the gift of the sun and therefore the arrows are male. So the moon, uh, the moon gave us the, uh, which is female, gave us the bow and the sun, which is male, gave us the arrows. So therein lies a whole nother philosophical discretion, discussion, but we'll, we'll focus just on the bow, not the bow today. So there it is in, in the sky uh, with the sun, as a matter of fact. And so that's, that's the design uh, of the Lakota bow. And here they are in real life. These are two bows that I've made, uh, I think, uh, over 10 years ago now. Uh, the long one that you see in the, in the picture with, in the photograph with the handle wraps and the shorter one beside it. So there are two basic kinds of bows, even, so the cap, even though the caption says three bows, there are two basic bow designs. One is a long one, and it's really not that long in terms of, in comparison to other types of bows that we see today, primitive or traditional bows. It's only uh, about 52 inches long, 52 to 54 inches long. And it all depends on the size of the person using it, it's measured according to his stature. So the longer bow in this picture, I think is 54 inches long. The shorter one is uh, 44 inches long. So those are the two basic types of bow, but you can see they do resemble the new moon. And the shape of the bow is such that at the handle part, it's thickest in, in profile from side to side, it's thickest and, and we make it so it tapers off until it's thinnest at the end, just like, just like the new moon. It's thickest in the middle and thinnest on the end. So that's how we make our bows. And interestingly enough, as far as the physics of this design, this design enables the bow to be drawn hundreds if not thousands of times and still withstand the stress of being drawn because the stress the physical stress of being drawn is distributed over the limb. And if it was the same, the equal thickness from, from center to end, the bow would break. But because of its design, it's flexible and it can be drawn over and over and over again. The long bow, both of them actually, uh, the longer of the two, I've shot more than the short bow. Uh, I think I made that in uh, 2010 or so. I don't know how many arrows I've launched from that particular bow, thousands and thousands of arrows. And it still works just as efficiently today as, as it is. And that's the one that you see above my head, the straight one on the top of the rack. That's the bow. The shorter bow, uh, the, the, the longer bow is a hunting bow. It's used uh, only for hunting, whether it's rabbits or squirrels or deer or elk or, or, or any of the big game. The shorter bow, there are two types of the shorter bow. One is the war bow that's used in combat, for combat, and for hunting bison or buffalo. So there are two types of the shorter bow. And the, the one that's used for warfare is just what is called in today's parlance a self bow. 
It's just made out of one piece of wood. Whereas with the, the, the bow that's used for hunting bison, um, for those of you who knew what sinew is, sinew is the cartilage that is in between the musculature of large animals. We use sinew to glue on the back of the, the bow that's used for hunting bison and it strengthens the bow. It gives more, it gives added power to the bow. So a, a bison bow can be upwards of 70 or 80 pounds of pull. So it's a very, very powerful bow. And the bison bow has to be powerful in, in order to send its arrow through the outer hide of a bison, which is very thick, and through the chest cavity, and through the ribs and, and through the heart and lung area. So that bow needed to be very, very powerful. Um, of the two, of the war bow and, and uh, the bison bow, the most prized was the bison bow. They were both necessities, but, but uh, the, uh, the, the hunter considered the, the bison bow his most prized possession. And he didn't just have one, he had several, maybe two or three, two or three bison bows, two or three hunting bows, and two or three war bows. So those are the, th uh, because of the caption, it says three bows, those are the three uses for the two types of bows that we have, that we had in, in Lakota culture prior to the acquisition of the firearm. Unfortunately, once the firearm came along, then of course the bow began to uh, be used less often, uh, even though it, 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 there are some of us who still know how to uh, make and use them. And there's a, there, there's a practical side to how we arrive at that bow. And one is the first thing is that we harvest a tree. And the kinds of trees that we use on, uh, in the Northern Plains uh, in, in what is now South Dakota and North Dakota are uh, oak, ash, and choke cherry in that order. Uh, uh, oak is a very dense hardwood and it's preferable, but it doesn't grow as straight as the ash tree that you see in this photograph. This is a photograph of an ash tree. And uh, a choke cherry is not a tree, it's a shrub. But if we find a choke cherry stem or stalk that is long enough and, and thick enough, then we use that for, for uh, bows as well because they're all hard wood. Hard wood is, is uh, what's necessary for making bows. This particular tree is only about four inches in diameter. And uh, this one was about eight feet long, eight feet tall. So I found this tree down by the Little White River up near my, uh, where I used to live in, uh, on the Rosebud Reservation. So what happens after we, uh, we harvest that tree is uh, going back to the pre-reservation days, uh, we would take the tree down, harvest it, usually in the winter time, and then we would split it in half, at least in half, so that we would have two staves uh, the word is English word is staves, and we would hang those up inside the lodge. Now, if you can imagine, you've all seen photographs of plains or Lakota lodges with the conical teepee made out of poles and hides. So the the man would hang up these two staves or, or more sometimes, just beneath beneath the smoke flap in the lodge, so that the rising heat would cure and dry the stave. And usually that process took about three years. When my grandfather uh, harvested a stave, he hung it behind the, the kitchen stove in the kitchen. My grandmother had a really gigantic square kitchen stove. My grandfather hung the staves behind that and then he would uh, let, let it cure and let it process. And that took a long time, uh, at least three years. So this is, on the left is, is the process of splitting the stave uh, in half, this from this to this. And then when I finish splitting it, then, then I have two staves. And those, this particular, these particular staves are still in my storage shelter, still going through the curing process. So what I just mentioned of harvesting and splitting is, is the practical side. We have to do that in order to have a stave to make a bow out of. 
So we, we talked about the harvesting process and the curing process. And when we harvested the, 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 the tree, we always left an offering, whether it's tobacco, whether it's uh, uh, even little bits and pieces of, of the hunter or the wool maker's own flesh, or, or even food, we left an offering at the tree, at, at the stump of the tree, because the tree is a living thing. It was a living thing. And, and we have the audacity to take its life for our purposes. So in order to, to try to compensate for that, we express our thanks and we leave an offering. And we use every bit of that tree, the, the, some of the leaves, some of the smaller leaves, smaller limbs, I should say, we could, if they were long enough, we could use for arrows. But we, when we split it in half and we scraped the, the, the bark off, we kept everything and everything was used either as kindling or something else. So we didn't waste any of that tree. And that, that's to respect uh, what that tree was uh, as a living thing. And it's just all the spiritual side of it. And uh, as I said, the curing and drafting, uh, the drying took about three years. And then once, the, once the, 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 the stay was deemed to be dry enough, and there was a process my grandfather used, he would take a smaller piece of wood and he would hold the stay up with his hand and then he would hit it like a hitting a bell. And then if it had that real, real hollow ringing sound, then it was dry enough. If, if it had a more of a thudding sound, and it, 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 had, it was kind of a dull sound, then it wasn't dry enough. So if it had that ringing sound, it was dry enough. So that's when he started crafting the bow. And in my grandfather's day, he used a very large butcher knife. It had about a 10 inch blade that he kept very sharp and a hatchet. With that hatchet, he kept both, 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 uh, both, uh, both cutting tools very, very sharp. He was always sharpening his, his hatchet and his knife. And to begin with, he would peel off all the bark so that he would have you know, a bare stave. And once he did that, then he, with his hatchet, he would outline the rough shape of the bow. And while he was doing that, he would tell me that in order to make a good bow, the, the bow maker had to be in a good place. He had to be in balance physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Uh, in other words, there could be nothing negative going on at that point in time. Um, for example, in the extreme, if there was a death in a, in a, in a close family, then the bow maker restrained from making bows and arrows because that's, that sadness and that grief would be imbued into the bow because the bow maker was handling the, the wood. So spiritually and, and physically, he is physically, he, he couldn't be ill. He couldn't be ill in any way because all of that negativity would be imbued onto the, onto the bow. So that's what I mean by the bow maker had to be in balance, physically, mentally, and spiritually. Uh, my wife died in 2013, and for a full year and a half after that, I, I made neither a bow or, or an arrow, and only recently I've started making bows and arrows again. So that's all part of, of, of respecting the bow. Uh, when, the, when the bow was finished, uh, it, it just, as you see above me, it's just a straight stick. And once you slide the string on into the string notches and it, it curves into the bow that you saw in the earlier pictures. When the hunter or the warrior took his bow out of the bow case to use it before he strung it, he touched the bottom end of the bow to the earth. The bottom end of the bow is where it was the, 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 the end that came out of the ground. We marked the staves so that we always knew which was the bottom, which was the top, because we wanted to keep it in flow with the, the life forces that came out of the earth. If you inverted the bow and used it that way, more often than not, it would break. But if you kept it 
in the, in the, in the position that it was it had in life with a bottom and a top. Then it, then it didn't break. So that was all part of respecting the bow. And also part of respecting the bow was to encase it in a very uh, artfully decorated uh, bow case. And the bow case and quiver was usually made by the by the women in the family. It wasn't done by the by the bow maker. The man made his own bows and arrows, but the women made the bow case and quiver. The photograph that I showed you first. So all of this is a spiritual side, and and there's that spiritual side because because the tree was a living thing, and we could never forget that it was so. Because it was a living thing, the ultimate respect we could pay, we could pay, pay the tree was to make the best bow possible, the best bow that our skill and our knowledge could produce. Because the hunting bow, the bow used for hunting, was a provider of life. The, the war bow, uh, and, it's, and the same for the buffalo bow. Uh, and the war bow, the, the one that the warrior used in combat was a protector of life. So anytime uh, the hunter harvested, uh, whether it was a rabbit or a squirrel or a deer or an elk or a bison, he brought his bow back and he smudged it because he used it to, to take a life. He smudged it usually with, with uh, sage to purify it again um, because it, it, it took a life. Um, and when likewise, when a warrior went out and fought in a battle with a bow, with his war bow, and if he wounded an enemy or if he killed an enemy, then that bow, when he came back, was not brought into the circle of the village. It was left outside. All the warriors did that, that they were participating in a battle. And before it could be brought back into the village and into, back into his home, there was a ceremony of cleansing. Again, it was smudged. The warriors themselves were wiped down with water. Usually the women did that. But again, the bow was smudged again to purify it and to get rid of the, of the negativity of having taken a life. So all of those are part of respecting this very, very uh, necessary and very sacred object. And these are, um, these are, this is a photograph of two young ladies uh, at one of the bow camps that I teach every year in the summer, usually in August. And it's to, it's to teach Lakota youngsters, usually from the age of 12 to 18, how to make bows and arrows. So these are photographs of what you see is, is an apparatus called a bow horse. It's, it's used to, to hold a bow in place the stave in place so we can we can carve on it, and the tool that they're using is 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 a draw knife, and as you can see, they're getting the bow down to the shape that we want. You can see the the outlines of the bow drawn on the sides of the bow. So these are two two girls, and uh, it, it, the the camp is open to to anyone from you know, usually Lakota uh, youngsters from the age of twelve to eighteen. And we teach, we teach them what, what, you know, what I've just been talking about, the various aspects, the cultural aspects of the bow. And then we take two or three days for them to go through the process of making, making their bows. And uh, so far uh, in, in all of the camps that I've taught over, I think the last 15, 16 years, everyone has finished their bow. We have on average 10, or so uh, bow makers. So uh, they're, they're always very surprised that their bow actually works and they, and they do. And this is a photograph of those of, from uh, two years ago. And this, this takes place uh, in South Dakota on a community called Melk's Camp uh, under the auspices of a nonprofit, native nonprofit called Lakota youth development and this is the bow making camp is one of the things we do with them we have other other cultural things that we teach them but this particular camp is just for to teach them how to make bows and as you can see they all have finished bows and each one of these youngsters 
made his or her own boat under the direction and tutelage of myself and other helpers. Uh, and this is the, the time, this first time they've gotten to shoot their bow. They've all, they also made the arrows. So in, in doing this, this simple exercise, and they don't consider it simple because it's very labor intensive. It's hard work to be able to make a bow. And we teach them about how our ancestors use, ancestors use the bow, how they display them, how they uh, uh, stored them away and how they use them in the hunt. And the final lesson is how to shoot it uh, in the Lakota, in the Lakota style. So bows and arrows are, are no longer as important as they once were. There was a time when every boy wanted a bow like his dad's or like his grandfather's or like his uncle's. And he was eager to learn how to use the weapon. Uh, much the same way as the youngsters today look at an, look at, look at an Xbox or, or, or some video game. But that was, that was how it was. And that's the way I was when I was growing up, when I was, when I was a kid, when I first saw my first bow. And you know, after my grandfather finished my, the bow he made for me, and I got to shoot it and, and learn how it all worked and so forth, I think I slept with it after that for several nights in a row. That's how important it was to me. And that's how important they, they are still to me. I don't sleep with the bows anymore, but they still are very, very culturally important to me. Uh, when we talk about natives anywhere, uh, we usually talk about powwows or celebrations. And the first thing we see is a native dressed in their regalia with their feathers and their headdresses and the women in their buckskin dresses or jingle dresses. And that's an obvious as aspect of our culture that still endures to this day. The bows and arrows have sort of fallen off, fallen by the wayside. Um, they began losing their popularity when the firearm appeared on the scene in our part of the country, probably about 1840. And most, uh, most of the men kept their bows and arrows as a backup. Uh, in the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876, uh, out of the eight to 1200 warriors that went into battle, half of them carried firearms and the other half carried bows and arrows. So at that point in time, they were still critical to our culture. But when we were put on reservations and we didn't need to hunt anymore, uh, the knowledge and the skill to make them sort of faded away. So I'm one of the fortunate ones in, I, in that I learned to make these artifacts from my grandfather who learned from his father and his uncles. Uh, so it's, it's it, at least in a few people, the, the craft of making them still lives on. So I think of bows and arrows as, 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 my, grand, as what my, grandfather described, my grandmother described them as daughters of the moon. Uh, and in, in some marriage ceremonies way back when in the old days, uh, a young couple getting married was liking to how a bow and arrow function. Uh, the, most, the most beautiful bow or the most beautiful arrow or the strongest bow was, was useless without the arrow. It couldn't fulfill its purpose without the arrow. Likewise, the straightest and most beautifully made arrow couldn't fulfill its purpose unless it was sent by a bow. So relationships were often described or, or people were advised to be like the bow and the arrow, realize each other's purpose and help each other achieve it. So anytime I, I, I work on a bow or, or I see one, uh, I think of what my grandmother said. And the one thing I would like to point out here in closing is that who knows how many native nations and tribes there were on this continent of North America, all the way from what is now the Arctic down into Central America. Uh, maybe several hundred, maybe even up to a couple thousand, but each one of those groups had their own design of bows and arrows and they differed slightly, uh, but they all made their own bows and arrows. So a Lakota bow would look different than a Cheyenne bow or uh, a bow used by an Apache or, or uh, any other tribes. So they all didn't look the same. 
what you're looking at is uh, two kinds of Lakota boats. So with that, uh, I'll stop uh, this discussion. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Thank you so much, Joseph. Thank you, thank you. The floor is for Mike and Christina. I definitely have some questions because I just find it so fascinating, but I wanna give you two both the floor first for any insights you have, things you've learned, what you loved, what you have questions about. The floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. Joseph, I was wondering, is there a, um, a tradition also around the retirement of a bow? Um, no, not really, but uh, usually a, a hunter uh, would keep his hunt his best hunting bow until it broke or until you know it got weak too weak to use anymore usually that meant years and years and years the one that i have above me uh, the one you see in a photograph i've had for i made it 10 years ago from a piece of hickory and it still shoots just as well as it ever did so i will keep it until you know until i'm old i'll, get, I'll pass it on to my my son or my grandson uh, but with war bows, it was different, especially if they were used in combat and, and they wounded or killed an enemy more than once. Then usually the, the warrior would uh, uh, dispose of it uh, by in a fire. He would build a fire just to dis dispose of that bow to get rid of the negativity that might still be clinging to that bow because it took a life. But keep in mind that some combat bows were usually lost in battle, too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I have a couple questions. Okay. okay. I'm going to jump in because I have mine. This I've been looking forward to this one. It was so exciting to hear about it because the way my mind works is it, it feels like a metaphor for so many things in life and how the more connected we are to our being and to what we're doing and, and how aligned that is and how we operate in the world with purpose and, and being conscious right. of our actions. Right. The more we create things like you do. And just for, for you guys here and for anyone that watches later, Joseph does sell these bows. So if you are interested or you know someone that it would be a great gift for, please do reach out to him and support his work because this is, it's, it's a slice into the past and something that we can carry forward that's been made with incredible intentionality. So in the notes, the show notes on YouTube, you will see ways to contact him directly and, um, if you're interested in bows. And you can also read more about a warrior and his bow in his book, The Journey of Crazy Horse, which you can order from either an indigenous bookseller or you can order from an independent bookseller that will also be listed in the show notes. So please do support those people. So that's one thing I wanted to say. My, my two questions, I have three questions, but I'll go through them fairly quickly. The first one is, what's the difference between a primitive and traditional bow? A uh, primitive bow is made with primitive materials. Uh, and usually just uh, meaning a wood. And uh, the, the buffalo bow is backed with sinew. Some native tribes even use uh, bighorn sheep, the horn of a bighorn sheep to glue to the back of a bow. So, but the, the, the watchword is all primitive natural materials are what compose a primitive bow. Both of these bows here are made of one piece of wood. Uh, the, the longer bow is um, hickory and the shorter bow is ash. And the string is made of sinew. In this case, it's synthetic sinew, but sinew, the kind of sinew that is on um, uh, along the spine of, of large animals like uh, antelope, deer, bison, and elk. So it's as much as possible, we make them from natural materials. Whereas a traditional bow is usually a wood, but it also uses fiberglass and modern glues and uh, those kind of things to make, and 
And the difference between the Lakota bow and the traditional bow is a traditional bow usually has a center handle of some kind. And those kind of bows usually are, have to be made specifically for the left-hander and the right-hander. Whereas these bows can be shot by, by people, of, you know, whether you're left-hander or right-hander, it doesn't matter. So those are the basic differences. Got it. And I love that um, I, am, I am reminded in myself in a conversation Mike and I had recently where I was telling him about these calls. And he said, I hear the reverence for those conversations when you talk about this. And that word is so present for me whenever we are in these conversations. And right. I get to listen to the things that you share about the past and, and generations back. I have so much reverence for you sharing that with us and with me. Right. I appreciate that. Right. Well, keep in mind that in the old days, pre-reservation days, the, the person who made these bows not only was taught reverence for the tree and respect for the bow he was making, but he also had reverence for the game he was hunting with the hunting bow. There was a whole process of going through uh, a protocol to go through uh, when a hunter is preparing himself for the hunt. Uh, and to the guy who made these bows a long time ago, hunting was not a sport. It was a necessity. It was all part of life and, and everything that and, and as such had to be respected and, and cared for. Beautiful. My second question, second and third, is um, what's the Lakota word for stave? Uh, there is no word for stave. It's just this, the, the echon is the ash tree. And we, we, we split that in half. And it's just, it's just wood. Chan is, is, is the, the word for wood. And but stave is an English word that we, we don't have a, a, a translation for. Are there different words for the different bows in Lakota? Uh, itazipa is, is uh, well, not necessarily, uh, because you look, look at a bow and you can see what it's for. The shorter bows, uh, the unbacked bow that's made out of one, the short unbacked bow that's made out of one piece of wood was usually nine times out of 10, uh, a war bow. And if it was, if you had sinew glued to the back of it and it was obvious if it did, that was a bison hunting bow. So just by looking at them, you knew what, what, the, what they were for, what their purpose was. And the word for bows in our in language is itazipa. And that, that's an all encompassing word. Got it. I find um, language so fascinating. And I know that people native to areas with snow and ice, like in the Northern part of Turtle Island and, and um, Alaska and things like that tend to have lots of different words for snow and ice. Exactly, exactly. So I was right. curious. And then my last one is, um, now my, I'm gonna show my, <laughs> my non-knowledge for lack of a better phrase of this particular question. Mm -hmm. Were bows and arrows just as important as personal shields that warriors would create? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. They, they were, you know, they had equal standing as far as the, what, what the accoutrements that a hunter and a warrior use. A warrior didn't, a man didn't carry, as a hunter, he didn't carry a shield to hunt, but a warrior in his warrior persona grabbed his shield and his war bow uh, to, to go off on a patrol or whatever. And a shield and, and bows and arrows were just, you know, equally important because uh, they, they, were, they all served a purpose and they all personified the man as the warrior or the hunter. Got it. Those are my questions. Okay. Christina, Mike, do you have more that you would like to share yes. or question? I, I would. Uh, Joseph, do, is, was there a difference? Um, you were speaking about your students and you had uh, a photograph of two young women. Is right. there a difference in the way that men and women would use the bow and the arrow? No, no. Okay. Primarily the, the, the males as a hunter and a warrior, that was their primary weapon for a long, long time, hundreds if not thousands of years. Girls were usually taught 
the use of the bow, uh, just so they would know in the event they needed to use them in whatever situation that might arise. But it was not their job to, to go out and hunt, or it was not their job to go out and, and fight. Although there were some women that were, were warriors as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so while women knew uh, just from being associated with them, watching their husbands, uh, they didn't use bows as much. But today, you know, we teach, uh, I teach both boys and girls. Mm -hmm. your, your students, um, you were mentioning that you're, you're teaching kind of, or, or maybe were teaching on an ongoing basis. Were you, um, the wood that they were working with was that wood also cured for three years prior to them working with those? Well, in order to have enough wood, we have to buy it commercially. Oh, and okay. There are places that we can do that from. And, and most of the wood we buy, for some reason, ash wood is really hard to buy commercially. But we, so we, we buy hickory, which mm -hmm. is a hard wood. So we buy mm -hmm. them commercially. Uh, but I've got uh, ash staves that I've been curing, like, as I mentioned, I think for three or four years that are ready to be, ready to be made into bows. Mm -hmm. And let me say one more thing about the, the, the performance of bows. Uh, a buffalo bow probably pulled, uh, it took 70 pounds of pressure, 70 to 80 pounds of pressure to pull it back. That's how stout it was. The average, and it could probably send an arrow, a heavy arrow, probably um, in a neighborhood of 180 feet per second. The hunting arrow was similar, the hunting bow was similar. Uh, it shot a longer, longer arrow because it's a longer bow and it could send an, an arrow probably in a neighborhood of 160, uh, 180 feet per second. And uh, the, the, uh, the war bow shot a lighter arrow and it had to be the fastest of the three. So it was usually very, very stout, very similar to the buffalo bow uh, and it could probably send an arrow upwards of 200 feet per second. Mm -hmm. So that was the, those were the capabilities of a, of a bow. Uh, Joseph, I also um, want to mirror what Christina said. I really appreciated the reverence um, for uh, the tree, um, the relationship that um, is honored with what, what I was hearing is that there is a relationship that's honored with everything that's utilized for purpose sure. and isn't anything wasted. And um, that's so much of what it, I feel that we've lost in our cultures today. And um, it, I really, really appreciated um, how the intentionality, uh, as Christina mentioned, in um, the materials that are used, um, the time that's taken, um, and it, it just keeps coming back to um, that it's not an inanimate, inanimate thing, that everything is a, uh, that is around is, has um, a life of its own, and when it's used in some way or taken, that, it's, um, that that life is honored for sacred purpose, and I just I really appreciated that. Sure. Yeah, thank you. So in closing, I'd like to ask Christina and Mike, what is one thing that you will take away from this call and conversation? As, uh, as Christina alluded to, um, the, the reverence for um, for all resources used in in this in the sustenance of uh, of life uh, and how much that can uh, how much that can translate to our lives how much we can slow down and offer some reverence to uh, that which we we take from the earth and uh, and return the favor with an offering as well. And for me, um, is just again the recognition that it, that nothing is separate from us, and um, how we live and how we walk in the world. Um, that 
basically we're creating what is right before us and um, having that um, sacredness allows um, for each of us to recognize that um, if we have that capability that what is before us we're we're walking um, in I guess in perpetual beauty is, um, and I, I, again, I feel like that's something that we have to remember. And, and it feels like it's speaking so loudly for us to recall at this point. And Joseph, final thoughts that you have from our conversation today and things you'd like to leave people with that maybe aren't on this call that watch it at a later time any call to actions you have for them and final message? I think, I think as, as uh, citizens of this planet, we have to be aware uh, as human beings, what we are doing to it. Uh, a Lakota elder was asked, uh, how can we help to help heal the earth? And his response was, the first thing is to stop hurting the earth. And, and I think if we keep that in mind, uh, you know, give the, give the Mother Earth, the Grandmother Earth a chance. Uh, she will heal herself with our help, with, with the attitude that we have, with the, with the awareness that we, we can have if we so choose. So, you know, it's, it's just the things that I learned from, from my grandfather and others like him. Uh, the one thing that stands out is how much he loved the bow for one thing. And the time he took to explain the relationship of the bow maker to the bow and why each step was necessary and why we needed to be respectful of this thing that we were creating. So I think, and I think that's the, that's the other thing that we all need to be mindful of is to approach everything with a certain amount of uh, respect. Thank you, Joseph. And I know that I'll be leaving with a very intentional thought of mindfulness and purpose, as well as reverence and honor and respect in the things that I do in the rest of my day, in the rest of my week, in the rest of this year, and the rest of my life. And I try to surround myself as much as possible with people on this call, with the calls with you, Joseph, and I'm always so honored to be able to do this with you and bring it into the world. And I thank you all deeply for being here with us. It's the highlight of my week when we get to do these. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah. For thank being you. all of you. And I hope you have a really great rest of your day. You too. You as well. Too. Thank you, Christina. Bye-bye. Hi, everyone.